So, Chiara. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Let me introduce you a little bit, although I don't think you need any introduction, but uh, uh, now that, that uh, you've been with, uh, with us for a while, uh, it's, uh, let me just say that is, it is a, a huge uh, pleasure and honor to have you with us today. I'm really, really very grateful that, uh, that uh, you could accept this invitation. Uh, even uh, being on leave, uh, you accepted to uh, kind of deal uh, with us, share with us your uh, exhaustion too, and uh, and and also uh, share uh, with us uh, your uh, anarcha feminist manifesto that uh, has just appeared. Uh, in Spanish by Net Ediciones, uh, and also the day after your bigger uh, book, Anarcha Feminism appeared uh, in English, which we celebrate really very much. It is a fantastic occasion. So it is, uh, as I said, really a pleasure that you're willing to be with us today. Chiara Bottici uh, holds a PhD in Social and Political Science. Uh, um, from Florence with the thesis uh, philosophy of political myth. Um, she has uh, had uh, several positions uh, uh, due to um, awards and invitations uh, all over the world. And uh, I will um, just mention a couple of, uh, as I said, uh, her publications, latest publications as uh, Manifiesto Anarcha Feminista just appeared uh, here in, Bar in Barcelona. The Italian translation is forthcoming in 2022, but uh, Anarcha Feminism, the bigger book, uh, just uh, appeared yesterday, as I said, and the Spanish translation is also forthcoming in Gerisa in 2022. The Italian translation is forthcoming also in 2022, and many other translations are going to appear also, um, which uh, makes clear the relevance of this um, proposal. Also, I would also want to uh, mention the a Feminist Mythology, another publication also appeared in 2021, uh, which will be um, uh, translated into Italian and published in 2022. Uh, Chiara Bottici is uh, currently working uh, assistant professor, uh, no, uh, um, not assistant, associate professor uh, and co-director of the Gender Studies uh, and co-founder of the Gender and Sexuality Studies Institute at the New School for Social Research in New York. And yes, no more words uh, on my side. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you so thank much, so much. Uh, for your kind introduction and, and thank you for um, inviting me uh, for, for two reasons. The first is existential. I think that I am exhausted has been uh, my uh, mantra for uh, at least uh, the last <laughs> years since I had the idea of having children. Um, every evening when I go to bed, before they go to bed, they look at me and they say, oh, mom is exhausted. I say, yes, I'm exhausted. So finally, we can turn that personal experience into uh, a collective philosophical project. <laughs> so, uh, well done. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and uh, the, the second reason, indeed, is, is, is philosophical. I do think that there's something very important happening at, uh, at the crossroad of this notion of exhaustion um, for, for a number of reasons. One is that the, the concept of exhaustion moves with, within two poles. On the one hand, it means fatigue. Uh, on the other, it means being completely used up, so completely depleted. Um, and, and I do believe that uh, women and all those who belong to the second sex um, are um, witnessing a moment in their history uh, where uh, exhaustion uh, has been moving from one side, that of the fatigue, to the other uh, of being uh, completely 
um, use that. So I decided to present the, the manifesto part, uh, which uh, for a number of reasons, first of all, because it's at the end of a long day uh, and I wanted to uh, help conclude with a note of looking forward and positive thinking. So manifestos are an expression of urgency, political urgency. Uh, and I think it's important to combat exhaustion, which can have always one of its effect in action. It's important to combat it by transforming exhaustion into anger and therefore as the manifesto and uh, um, the angry form of writing that I want to share with you. So we live under a global monocracy. Maybe patriarchy is declining, maybe men are no longer the single head of the family, but they are still the first sex. Whereas patriarchy literally means the rule of the male head of the family and has been toppled in many contexts, the concept of monocracy points to the power, kratos, that men still exercise over all the other sexes and genders. Thus, monocracy can thrive even in contexts where patriarchy, the rule of the patriarch, is declining. And it is thriving now. In a time when the world has become a global village, when viruses travel instantly worldwide, we cannot pretend we need not know. And so we know. What do we know? We know the women. Two spirits, LGBTQ plus people, are politically, economically, socially, and sexually oppressed. No matter which sources of oppression we focus on, class, race, gender, empire, disability, ecology, and so on and so forth, the second sex is always at the bottom, and cis men are always on top. There are many tools by which men exercise their privilege, but a useful list includes death, the state, capital, and what I call the marginal. Death, because the second sex is the object of a worldwide gender side. The state, because the sovereign state is an instrument of the sovereign sex. Capital, because its economics exploit some genders more than others and the marginal because the global monocratic imaginary constantly produces images that are detrimental and oppressive for women and for all the other second sexes. First, the worldwide gender side. There is a war going on globally and the war is waged against women, to spirit, third gender and LGBTQ plus people. Why are there more men than women on the planet, despite the fact that women tend to live longer? Where have all the missing girls gone? The missing girls are not counted in the hundreds or thousands, but it's in the millions. It's currently estimated that at least 126 million girls are missing from the global population just as a consequence of sex selective abortion, infanticide, inequalities of care, and feminicide. Death as the, is the biopolitical epitome of exhaustion. The second sex is so exhausted that many of us simply went missing. So you can see here are the two meaning of exhaustion, fatigue on one hand, or depletion being completely used up, meet and reinforce each other. Women are not the only object of gender side. At least 69 countries worldwide have national laws criminalizing same-sex relations between consenting adults, while some have laws directly targeting transgender and gender non-conforming people. Should we stay home to avoid rape, violence and killing? No, because homes, as we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, are not safe for the second sex. As the lockdown wore on, gender violence in all of its form went up. Together with trans and queer theory groundbreaking work aimed at questioning gender binaries and identification, 
it's important in my view to vindicate once again the need for a form of feminism that opposes the oppression of people who are perceived as belonging to a second sex. And by second sex, I mean here a revisiting of the traditional notion used by uh, Simone de Beauvoir. So I use second sex in such a way to indicate all the femina who occupy this position. So it's a space that it's, in my view, inhabited and defined both by people who have been assigned female at birth, by people who have been assigned male at birth, queer subjectivity, and so on and so forth. Why do I combine it with anarche? Because anarcha feminism means precisely a feminism without anarche, that is a feminism without hierarchies and rulers, including sexual, economic, and racial hierarchies. The reason for this is that freedom is indivisible. So we cannot fight one form of oppression without fighting all the others at the same time. All forms of oppression inhabit the same house. Uh, what is this house? This is the house of domination, the house based on the idea that some people are superior to others and that on the basis of this superiority, they have the right to rule over others. Sexism, some sexes are superior to other sexism. Racism, some races are superior to other racism. Classism, some people are superior to other classes. All these forms of oppression, they inhabit the same house. Hilary Lazar proposes to think of domination as a knot. So in this knot, in certain, you have to pull single threads, uh, at times giving more attention to one form of oppression, at times giving more attention to other forms of oppression. But we must never forget that until we undo all the different threads in the knot, we cannot get rid of uh, domination and oppression. But you can also here see with this metaphor why some people are more exhausted than others. Capitalism exhausts everybody. It works with the extraction of surplus value uh, from bodies and with the extraction of free reproductive labor from bodies. But those who are uh, in the middle of this knot of oppression and constantly have to fight against class exploitation, extraction of surplus value, extraction of free care work, uh, homophobia, racism, transphobia, you see how uh, the knot becomes particularly suffocating and exhausting. So we are all exhausted, but some of us are more exhausted than others. Against the ge gender side and all forms of gender violence, we anarcha feminists call for the liberation of all women to spirit and LGBTQ plus people. Not one less, either all or none of us will be free. Second, the second sex is an instrument of the sovereign sex. One of the main instruments through which men perpetrate their privilege and make sure they remain the sovereign sex is the state. Cisgender men are the sovereign sex because like the sovereign se se states, they do not have to recognize any sex superior to theirs. And, and remember the traditional definition of sovereignty, Thomas Hobbes is, who is the sovereign, those who are in the position that they don't have to recognize any superior to them. That's the position of men. That's why it, they are the first and therefore the sovereign sex. Now the state has always been the tool whereby a minority rule over the vast majority, but few notice the intrinsically gendered dimension of this formidable power. The world is currently divided into sovereign states, meaning that there's hardly any piece of land that is not covered by a sovereign state. But this also means that we are forced to live under state rules, which is tantamount to saying we were forced to live under man's rule. 
the percentage of women occupying key uh, state roles globally is so insignificant that it cannot but appear at the exception confirming the rule, the rule of men. In 156 states examined in 2021, and these were the states who gave data, others refused to give data about their gender. So we can guess what is those data they were not provided. But out of 156 of the states, which supposedly are those were doing at best with gender, it came out that only 20% of ministers were women, while in 81 of them, women have never, never occupied the position of the head of state. So it's not an exaggeration to say that by living under state rule, we live under men's rule. It is men who decide what is legal, what is illegal, who, how and when to pay taxes, who, how and when be employed, inherit property, have or not have health care, kindergarten, abortion, sex changes, and so on and so forth. Given that we live under a monocracy, are we surprised to learn that women are overall paid 63% of what men get for the same job? No, we are not surprised. Does this mean that we should fight to have women president? No, it means that we should fight to have no president at all. There cannot be a feminist state because feminism means fight against the oppression of the entire second sex. And the state is and has always been a tool whereby a minority rules over the majority of people. As Chinese anarcho-feminist Hei Jinjian pointed out a long time ago, the majority of women are already oppressed by both the government and men, and the electoral system simply increasing this uh, oppression by adding a third ruling group, which is elite women. When a few women in power dominate the majority of uh, the powerless second sex, father class differentiation is brought into existence. But if a majority do not want to be controlled by a few men, why would they want to be controlled by a few women? Instead of competing with men for power, Hegen concluded women should strive to abolish a uh, men rule, which will mean no more subjective women, but also no more subjective men. The relevance of her words written in 1907 show how prophetic anarcho-feminism has been from its inception. So why anarcho-feminism? Because it's the best antidote against the possibility of feminine feminism becoming simply class elitism, or even worse, white privilege. In an epoch when the election of a single woman as president is often presented as the liberation for all women, the fundamental message of anarcho-feminists of the past is, in my view, more urgent than ever. As Penny Corniger put it, feminism does not mean female corporate power or a woman president. It means no corporate power and no presidents. Intersectionality has recently become a term for a lot of uh, social movements and philosophies that have been emphasizing precisely uh, this point that you cannot fight one form of oppression without looking at all the others. Um, it's interesting that uh, in this, uh, an, uh, on all the literature on intersectionality, there's very mention uh, only occasionally of the anarcho-feminist tradition of the past that has been arguing exactly the same point. This is largely because anarcho-feminists of the past uh, we're not interested in building philosophical or even political canons. Uh, in a way, uh, there is a contradiction in the idea of an anarcho-feminist canon. Most of those who uh, have been elaborating anarcho-feminist ideas, uh, they were mainly interested in uh, uh, 
fighting uh, against the oppression of the second sex, much less so in building canon. Uh, so if you when you start researching on anarcho-feminism, what you discover is that not all uh, those who have been doing uh, uh, anarcho-feminist work call themselves anarcho-feminists. Hei Jin Jen is one example, but uh, Emma Goldman, which, which is uh, uh, one of uh, um, the main figure in the anarcho-feminist tradition, uh, for instance, doesn't use uh, the term anarcho-feminism. And the reason for this is that at the time, feminism was mainly associated with a small group of suffragette people, uh, and uh, Goldman says, well, if feminism means just getting a few white middle-class women in power and ruling over the others, I'm not particularly interested in being called a feminist. So um, it is a, a tradition that is hard to pin down precisely because it uh, moves and it never crystallized into a canon uh, to be... Um, uh, transmitted, but at the same time, I think that it's fundamental message that um, freedom is indivisible. And so even if one happens to be in a position of privilege, the oppression of the vast majority of the other second sexes around us will come to us in the ugly face of global monocracy. So every single act of gender oppression exploitation, every single act of gender violence contribute to the subjection of the second sex as a whole and thus paves the way for its gender side. So against the violence perpetrated by the sovereign state in order to maintain the sovereign sex in its privilege, we anarcho-feminists call for the liberation of the entire second sex. Ni una menos either all or none of us will be free. Third, at the beginning was movement. So anarchism does not mean absence of order. It means searching for an order without an orderer. The main order of our established way of thinking about politics is the state. And, and the main suit whereby states control the population within their territories is the policing of border. Now, we live in an epoch where we take for granted that the state has the right to map and monitor the gender of the people who, who compose it. But why do we even take that for granted in the first place? We, why have we become so accustomed to these biopolitical apparatuses that uh, govern us by governing our identities. It's because of the state and the way in which it regulates boundaries that uh, not only we come to accept and live with these gender identities attached to us, uh, and who literally expose it each time we were asked for our identity papers uh, or our passport, but we also start to perceive migration as a problem. But if we keep in mind that the human beings, and there are larger uh, archaeological evidence showing that the human species has always been moving across the globe, we realize that the problem is not migration. The problem are the forces that turn migration into a problem. And the sovereign state is certainly one of it's the major institute that by policing the border make migration uh, and gender transition appear as a problem. So far from being the solution, it is the source of the problem if we keep in mind that at the beginning was movement. Um, This is why against the violence perpetrated in the name of state boundaries and the racism they support against historical amnesia, they lead us to forget that at the beginning was movement, we anarcho-feminists call for the liberation of all women to spirit and LGBTQ plus people, not one less, nehuma menos, either all or none of us will be free. Four, capital sin. If we take the globe as our framework, 
the first striking data to emerge is that people across the globe have not always been doing gender. And moreover, even if they did it, they did it in very different and variegated terms. It's only with the emergence of European colonialism uh, through a worldwide capitalist system that the rigid gender binary we are now so accustomed to has become hegemonic. This clearly does not mean that sexual difference did not exist before capitalism, nor the global capitalism invented patriarchy from scratch. It simply means the binary gender roles were not as universally accepted as the primary criteria according to which to classify bodies. Social feminists have long since been emphasizing how capitalism needs a gender division of labor because being predicated on endless expansion of profit it needs both the extraction of surplus value from wage productive labor and unpaid reproductive labor. We've heard about it uh, already uh, this morning. We should uh, add perhaps that a lot of the reproductive work performed by women in the global South is excluded from the wage labor market, as we have heard, but is also strictly dependent on the use of natural resources and the environment. So what appears to multinational corporations as weeds to be uh, eliminated uh, in order to create monocultures are often gardens that indigenous women cultivated for centuries. And you can see here how exhaustion again reveals its polyedric being, not simply fatigue, the fatigue of reproductive work, but also the exhaustion of the res and the complete elimination of the resources available. Whereas the monocultures and industrial farming produce capital for global market, they are often created at the expense of the destruction of the natural environment that provided indigenous people with the means for subsistence. As ecofeminists has been pointing out for quite some time, what industrialism sees as nature, that is as something that is available for free and can be extracted for free, is very often the second sex social labor. Along with the extraction of free labor from the second sex and from nature, capitalism also needs to extract free natural resources from the environment and to create mechanisms for regulating the flux of labor. This is why capitalism uh, has to go together with racism, that is, as Anibal Quijano illustrated with the notion of coloniality of power, with a form of power that is intrinsically dependent on racism uh, as, as a social scheme, as a mental map that makes certain bodies more exploitable uh, than others. Now, by building on the notion of the coloniality of power, Maria Lugones has recently put forward the very useful co uh, concept of a coloniality of gender. What do we mean by coloniality of gender? Um, with this mean term, she emphasized how the binary division, men and women, and the classification of bodies according to the racial belonging went together. You can't separate gender from race, uh, both being exported by Europeans as a twin product um, with the very process of um, the creation of a worldwide capitalist system. Within the American context, for instance, she points out how gender roles were much more flexible and variegated before the arrival of the European settlers. Different indigenous nations had, for instance, a third gender category and a really an incredibly um, incredible variegated set of terms to denote and positively recognize two spirits, intersex bodies, third genders, and queer subjectivities. Some people, such as the Yuma, had a tradition of designation of gender based on dreams. So somebody who had been assigned female at birth, but dreamed about weapons would become a male for all the purposes of social life. 
Now, this is not to indulge in a romantic view of uh, um, uh, an indigenous past that was gender fluid. Uh, certainly is not a way to repropose uh, an opposition between indigenous state of nature uh, versus the civilized condition we currently live in, which would be another way to reproduce uh, the colonial uh, political philosophical apparatus focusing on uh, and studying the different gender regimes that were operating before colonialism is a way for showing the contingency of its appearance. Uh, and the fact that the binary gender system that divides bodies into the, uh, two supposed biological sex and that puts cis men on top of it is a contingent product of history. Uh, we, can, we can precisely date when it came into being, and we can also hopefully hope that it will be dismantled at some point or another. Against this systematic intertwinement among capitalist economy, racial classification of bodies and gender oppression, against this boundary drawing, the prop up the first sex in order to make the second one more exploitable, we anarcho-feminists call for the liberation of all women to spirit, third gender, and LGBTQ plus people. Not one less, nicht eine wenige, either all or none of us will be free. Five, another woman is possible. Why feminism and why women? At this point, one may object, why insist on the concept of feminism, not just call this anarchism, why focus on women? If the purpose is to dismantle all type of hierarchies, uh, why not getting rid of the gender, gender binary, which opposes men and women and imprison us in this heteronormative and cisnormative matrix? So, why we keep talking about women is, first of all, because there are a lot of people who use this term and use this term as a um, tool uh, to describe themselves. So we can't get rid of women because there are bodies uh, going around that define themselves and are defined as women. Hence the importance of keeping feminism there and not just uh, um, making it disappear into a general anarchism. Furthermore, when we say women, we are not speaking about an eternal uh, essence or even less so about a pre-given object. When I, when, I, when I say women, I'm talking about a process and a process of uh, uh, becoming that is constituted by mechanism of affective association taking place at the inter, infra, and supra individual level. Uh, this is the part of the work where I developed this philosophy of trans individuality combining certain reading of Spinoza uh, with a, a reading of uh, uh, Simon Don, but also uh, non-Western traditions such as the Buddhist notion of Pratitya Samutpada, which I interpret not simply as interdependence, but as co-origination. Okay, what do I mean with this philosophy of trans individuality? Um, very, put in, in a very simple term, I mean precisely the fact that bodies are never individual, but uh, they are always the result of a relation. So the relation is the real thing, and it's a relation that connects individualities not only at the inter-individual level, but also at the infra-individual level. Talking about uh, women's bodies and the second sex bodies as trans-individual bodies means uh, not only to emphasize that they are the result of an in inter-individual encounter, let's say a sperm and an ovum, but also that they are made up by infra-individual bodies, such as the air we breathe, the food we eat, the bacteria inhabiting our bodies, or the hormones that we may take during uh, gender transition. 
Now, although um, you can see here the advantage of this uh, trans individual philosophy, first of all, instead of first deliberating a form of feminism and then adding um, anti racism and ecology, here all the three are interconnected. Because as Emma Golda sa Goldman says, life is interconnected, being is interconnected. So um, anarcho-feminism is also by definition a form of uh, um, eco-feminism and it's a form of, I call it decolonial and de-imperial feminism because it calls us to get rid constantly, embark in this process of getting rid of all the structures of domination that we have internalized. And I should also say that if we conceive uh, bodies as trans individual bodies, then um, transgendering appears as simply one of the many ways to individualize as a woman. Uh, there are people who individualize as women by being assigned female at birth, and there are bodies that individualize as bodies by being assigned male at birth and doing a gender transition. Uh, throughout the process of uh, becoming women. So in sum, we can say a trans individual philosophy teaches us that another woman is not just possible. Another woman is always already there being disclosed to us. So against the violence perpetrated in the name of gender binarism and the transphobia, we anarcho-feminism call for deliberation of all women, not one less, pas une de moins. Either all or none of us will be free. Six, trans individual ecology. So within such a philosophy of trans individuality, every being, not just humans or animals, is endowed with the capacity to affect and being affected. And this is how they strive to persist in their being. The notion of affected is indeed central to this ecology because ecology in a way is nothing by e eco-affectivity. So is a thinking of co-affectivity as co-origination. Now this move prevents us in my view from collapsing ecology into an all encompassing organicism where the whole determines in its part. Um, the advantage of the notion of trans individuality is precisely the fact that it still focuses on individuality, but it enables us to think of individualities outside of uh, the metaphysical uh, idea of a uh, hierarchy of being, and in the, the um, philosopher called it the scala nature, the uh, chain of being, they divided and classified being ontologically uh, according to um, their different degrees of profession. And we know um, ever since Aristotle, what that uh, scala natura sounded like, man on top of woman, on top of slave, on top of animal, on top of plant, on top of inanimate matter. If we assume this trans individual uh, view and philosophy, then even uh, not just plants, but even the, what appears as inanimate matter will show its power to become constitutive of our being. So the molecules we breathe not only collect us with the forest uh, on the other side of the globe, but those molecules, they become constitutive of our being. So the environment is not outside there. The environment is literally us. Against the violence perpetrated in the name of that contradiction in terms called green capitalism, against that monocratic hierarchy of man on top of woman, on top of slave, on top of animal, on top of plant, on top of inanimate matter, we anarcho-feminists state that all matter is to some extent animate. So there cannot be a liberation of the second sex without a liberation of the entire planet. 
not one less, non una di meno, either all or none of us will be free. Technologies of the self. The marginal apparatus to sustain global monocracy has infiltrated even the very process of becoming woman. The second sex bodies are everywhere the object of a process of disciplining, the purpose of which is not simply to govern bodies, but to instill in us the idea that our bodies need to be governed. Images and rituals of health, beauty, and care change a lot from one context to the other, but they are everywhere one of the most powerful sites for the exercise of what with a Foucauldian term we could call the menocratic technologies of the self. This is how the style subjects are created, not only through the imposition of rules from the outside, not only through the extraction of surplus value from our labor, but also through the voluntary and at times even joyful participation to one's own submission. Examples. Since the 19th century, that is since the, the emergence of industrial society and compulsory military service, European men have undergone what is known as the great masculine renunciation. What is this renunciation? Well, men who think of uh, uh, the great sovereign of uh, um, uh, the, the reign in France and the French aristocracy, men and who used to wear all the colors, laces, and bodily adornments, um, ceased to wear all those colors and adopted the sober colored two pieces suit, which is worn today as the default men attire. And this is across all the different um, classes. So whether it is the president of the United States or uh, a working class person who is going for a job interview, you will see men all uniformly dressed in the same suit and possibly a tie, which as uh, um, fashion historians remember us, the suit actually derives from the military uniform. And uh, uh, if you close it, uh, you can see that is the military uniform just open on the chest to reveal the tie, which clearly is the phallic symbol that uh, now stays for the weapon. What is the point here? The point is by renouncing all the bright colors and variation, men made it clear that they did not need them, thereby reinforcing their status as the first sex. It is women and the second sex more in general that constantly need to prop themselves up, carrying all the burdens of color, laces, extravagances, care once again. Now the very disparity between men's uniformity and women's ever-changing fashion since the Industrial Revolution reinforces the idea that women literally need makeup. They need, that is, they need to make up for something else that they would otherwise lack. So women bodies are not only the object and subject of vastly more beauty care than men's are. They're also medicalized and pathologized to a degree inconceivable in the case of the sovereign sex. So you see how care is this polyhedric concept that includes all types of care, reproductive care, uh, beauty uh, care, technologies of the self, but also health care. Now, why can it be that women are supposed to visit a gynecologist once a year, whereas men can lead an entire life without ever seeing an urologist. Now, why do women's sexual organ need so many more checkups than men's? Are we assuming that something must have gone wrong and we need to check those parts once a year because they are women's sexual organ? 
female genitalia never seem to be appropriate the way they are and undergo constant rituals of adjustment and beautification that vary enormously in the different contexts, but they are relentless in their disciplining effect. For instance, whereas men rarely undergo complete depilation, women are increasingly expected to have all the hair of their bodies and even the hair of their pubis to be clean and stripped of all the air in order to be desirable and sexy. But why do we need to have prepubescent genitals in order to be acceptable? If it is true that hair appears on the pubis when we reach puberty, what is being asked for of us when the visual order of things expect that our vulvas look like we have never reached maturity? Are we meant to remain little girls forever? Can we greet everybody and politely walk away from this monocratic visual order of things? From this imaginal order that constantly reproduces the state of the second sex? Probably not that quickly. From Chinese traditional foot binding to Western high heels wearing, the control of women's feet is yet another tool for disciplining our bodies. Whether prevented from their natural growth because small feet were said to be particularly attractive or seduced into walking over powerful high heels because by walking on pointy little penny substitute were perceived as being particularly dressed up, women's feet never seem to be in their right measure. But why can men be perfectly masculine while wearing perfectly comfortable shoes, whereas women have to be in pain in order to be truly feminine? Have we tried to walk for an entire day over uh, eight centimeters hills, which are considered to be the epitome of femininity? How have we come to accept this gender binary and this systematic association of femininity with pain and suffering. We anarcho-feminists call for a liberation of women and the entire second sex literally head to toes. So we pledge to fight state fascism and plantar fascities, rape and osteoarthritis, phallocracy and material stagia, sexual harassment and unions, denial of abortion rights and bond spores, gender pay gap and ankle sprays, feminicide and for animal stenosis, gender mutilation and stretch fractures, lower back pain, cramps, spams, everything that goes on in the discipline of our body and that is source of pain. In some, we anarcho feminists want the entire second sex to be able to walk and walk free. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, yes, indeed, this was a manifesto for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if uh, the, the those of us who, who still are here uh, have uh, any comments, questions, uh, objections, uh, counter manifesting uh, opinions. Uh, maybe in the meantime, I can begin with a couple uh, of, uh, of questions. I have one is maybe a little bit provocative, but it's just to keep playing in this, yeah. in this uh, way. Um, the first one is um, not a, a, a joyful one, is a serious one be because it has to do with this, um, again, uh, remembering that uh, this uh, seminar is also um, frame in the, ha takes place in the framework of the uh, 25th of November uh, celebration. Um, 
I, I, I am I'm rather interested in your notion of, uh, uh, which I think it's a neologism of gender side <clears throat> as a way of maybe, as I take it, making clear that uh, uh, the term femicide, which is problematic, uh, Miriam, uh, we, should, we would say from, from the very beginning, from its uh, uh, creation, as it were, uh, shows to be an, an insufficient definition or an insufficient way in order to deal with the complexity of uh, violence against women, which in your uh, consideration of that appears to me to be a rather, let me use this word, reticular violence too, that deploys itself in a, in a network of uh, uh, um, subjectivities and practices and uh, institutions too. So to me, gender aside uh, is a way of trying to put a name to the specificity of uh, violence against women, um, or as you put it also, against all of uh, the femina. Um, so the question is regarding to that, uh, what, what does it bring us theoretically, uh, or conceptually, politically, where, where does it, because I feel rather interpolated by that. Uh, so wh where does it bring us? That would be the first question. Um, maybe I, I can just take the other one and maybe you will see some connections uh, between the two. The second, the most um, provocative uh, thing um, relates back to uh, what appeared to be my obsession this uh, in, uh, afternoon, especially evening, regarding the, the political agency you know, and the political subject as well. Um, having to cope with uh, this um, um, uh, several ways that you've also mentioned uh, of uh, discip disciplination of our bodies from the point of view of the imaginary, what, what, what is then left in terms of political agency and political subject? How do we constitute, how women or all the femina constitute ourselves as a subject ahead of or in non-consideration of this second sex uh, determination? Is it, do we just to take out all our makeup, if we are using makeup, away uh, and our high heel shoes, if we have them away, how do we do that? No? How do we manage? That, that would be the second question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. These are um, all important questions. Um, and indeed, there is a connection between them. So the term gender side, I introduced it because I wanted to escape from uh, uh, the binary uh, between uh, um, femina and, uh, um, and, uh, and men, you know, the gender binarism. And I also want, it, it's a way to pluralize genders. And it's a way uh, here, I, I have to say, inspired also by indigenous feminism. Uh, I, I studied, uh, since I moved to the United States, um, I, st I started to study uh, the different terms that indigenous people use here for gender. And I started to do it uh, the day I've read Paula Gunn Allen essay called The Red Roots of White Feminism. When I arrived here, I had this idea that of the different feminist wave beginning with the suffragette and then first wave feminism and second and then as soon as I started to read that essay, I realized that that wave system here work as yet another tool for the erasure of the experience of indigenous women. Uh, feminism did not begin when a group of suffragette white middle class women started to ask the right uh, for um, uh, political participation. Feminism here began with the struggle of the Native uh, uh, Americans, uh, and in particular, the Native American uh, um, 
other genders, and not only women, but also uh, two spirit people. Two spirit is an umbrella term that is has been embraced. Uh, two spirit and third gender are two umbrella people that have been embraced by Native American people to denote, um, let's say, forms of uh, subjectivity that do not fit the binary. Now, the important thing is that uh, Paula Gunhallen says, so Native American women and two spirit have been fighting uh, here for millennia. Would a few hundred years of settler colonialism undo all the work that we have done? Think of a, many features of US feminism, like for instance, uh, uh, the different dressing codes, permissivism in, in terms of child rearing. So many of those features, I don't want to take too much time. I know we are exhausted after such a long day, but so many features of uh, um, US feminism speak more about those red roots than they speak about the culture that the European settlers brought with them, which is largely a culture uh, dominated by uh, Christian patriarchy, and, and we know how that works. So those subjectivities, uh, if we get rid of uh, the, uh, the myth of the vanishing Indian and the idea that all the Native American had been exterminated, which is not true, I mean, they went through genocide, but they are here alive and resisting, we can very well see how uh, whenever there's oppression, there's resistance. And the resistance, for instance, of, of these indigenous people has been going on uh, and is not stopping. I mean, it's continuing. Is the settler con colonial mentality that sees feminism and reduces it to the battles of the white uh, settlers in this country that erase that experience and makes it invisible. But it is here and it is striving, it's still resisting. So that's one answer to, you know, why not feminicide, why not feminicide and gender side to pluralize. But you can also see how my answer would be to the second question. Um, along with the, those technology of the self, there are also sites of resistance. Um, and I, for me, that part of the manifesto is important because uh, although I do believe that collective projects um, and such as, for instance, uh, uh, the way in which uh, the feminist movement has reinvented the strike, uh, the collective strike, point to the fact that um, taking to the street is not the only way to fight. I mean, the fight can also be at the micro level of insubordination, questioning of uh, gender roles and questioning of um, what are underlying assumptions. And in this sense, yes, I do, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong in wearing high heels, but can we say that it's painful instead of pretending we're fine with that? Uh, can we try to subvert that imaginal order of things in some creative way. Those for me are not just, uh, you know, individual acts of rebellions, they are political act because they show that a different order of things is possible. Okay, thank you. Yes, there's another, it makes me think of one of the slides that I saw in, in Laura uh, presentations, if I remember correctly, no? when you mentioned the title of one chapter of, of uh, the manifesto, you said another woman is possible. And I remember uh, one of the slides saying another end is possible. No? This, uh, and I understand it is in this alteration, in this, um, yes, making, making this, uh, logic somehow other othering it i don't know if uh, the word would put excess like like you're doing and i would like to mention that too comment uh, on that with you uh i think that when you say in the beginning was movement i mean that the material 
translation of anarcha feminism, at least in, in, in your position that you, that you've said, shared with us today, consists precisely in this othering of the logic uh, in that in the beginning uh, you 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 say there's neither uh, logos no yes. the word reason uh, measure proportion all these words would translate logos no neither is there chaos the yeah. opposite so actually what you are doing, that I find this operation very interesting, and I understand that this othering consists precisely, precisely of that, you're not taking a different side in the opposition and, though, and thus standing on the, in the binary order, but you are just um, kind of uh, suspending this uh, binarism, like you now explained with the term of uh, uh, gender side, no? Yeah. And you're saying, no, in the beginning there, there was movement. No, and and uh, this I find this uh, um, um, operation very interesting. This othering, uh, opening up for a possibility of uh, fighting domination. If we understand domination as we can do, I reading it's very far away now in time. But this morning <laughs> we were we we're talking about domination as fixation. No, yeah. as fixation or as immobility. You can be fixed in many places. You can be fixed in an essence. You can be fixed in a place. You can be fixed in a time. You can be fixed in an identity. Uh, so I find it really very interesting, the fact that you are opening up this possibility by saying, well, in the, be in the beginning was movement. So let's stick to that. No? Let's stick to that. So this is the new Evangelion, as you see, it's the new, the new good news, <laughs> the new blessing. <laughs> well, at least it is a different one. I mean, yes. we have been uh, with uh, the Logos at the beginning for a few millennia. Let's try a different beginning and see where it's leading us. Yeah, it's uh, the anarcho-feminist Evangelion uh, that we have here. <laughs> so this is, I mean, uh, uh, um, the word no evangelion means uh, good news so it's, yeah. it's really good news no okay i, I don't know I, I i would like i would like to keep on uh, talking to you but i'm i'm sorry that it's also late it's late for all of yeah. us much yeah. later than we had uh, uh, agreed i don't know if anyone still would uh, share a word and if not uh, really i can't i can't find find words to say how uh, glad and, and, and grateful I am for this uh, seminar today, for your closing, opening remarks. <laughs> and I'm sure we will uh, all now run to find your uh, Anarcha Feminist Manifesto and keep, keep uh, talking to you, maybe also in our dreams, no? Yes. So, so no, well... We, we... Let's keep the conversation going. I do believe that this um, emphasis on exhaustion uh, is an important addition to, uh, to the toolbox, to the feminist toolbox. We've talked a lot about exploitation and uh, domination and uh, uh, different forms that it takes. And I do believe there's something uh, happening here at the in the space of the two meaning of the term, fatigue, but also being completely depleted. Right? Yes. Yes. That it's, uh, it's relevant yes. for the future. So, yeah. Um, yeah, let's keep going. Yes. Thank you yes. so much. Let's keep going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of us. Thank you, all of them who yeah, stayed here until the end, which is not the end. And, and yes, see you soon. Somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Bye bye.